<laughs> Last night he was doing the gig here with us. And in the room we had non-musical people, we had professional musicians, we had amateur musicians, and everybody appreciated the music on slightly different levels. Right. But it's difficult to pin down what maybe the non-musician hears in, say, your sound and the way you phrase things that makes it appealing to them than maybe someone who shoves a million notes in who would just get lost in, in that feeling. Don't get me wrong. There are times when I'll shove a million notes in. I know you can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, and it's, it's, not a question, it's not a question of lack of notes or a lot of notes. And, and because that's the next mistake that musicians will make is in thinking, well, okay, so playing emotionally means playing less notes. Mm. Or, you know, or you just say you're an emotional player because you can't play. You don't have chops, so then you fall back on that. Yeah. And it's, it's still going beyond that. It's the emotional resonance is in your playing. If you're doing screaming bebop and playing cascades of notes and courses of notes, I love giant steps not because of the technical mastery of what John Coltrane played, but because of the passion and emotion that was in the performance. That, I think that's what speaks to people 50 years later, 60 years later, when you still go back and you still study that solo, and I still have my transcription, and I still try and play along with it. You know, it's, it's the emotional content that was behind the notes. So it's not only choosing what notes to play, and if it's a cascade of notes, that's great. And there's definitely a time when, when the cascade of notes is called for, but it's still the emotional intent that there is behind those notes. Sure. So I think for the listener, they don't, for the non-musician specifically, they don't know good from bad. They just know something that touches them or, or doesn't. And they come, and, and I think that's, I, when I was playing in, in bands for weddings, I used to hate Girl from Ipanema. Girl from Ipanema was the worst song. I can't even say it because no, I, I hated it. Because you couldn't say it. <laughs> Which one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Girl from Ipanema was the most horrible song because I thought it was lame and, yeah. you know. <laughs> and I finally actually heard the original Stan Getz recording because I hadn't heard it. I had just heard sad wedding bands play it. When I heard the Stan Getz recording, it was one of the most beautiful songs I had ever heard. So a lot of it is just in the performance, and people get exposed to jazz. Wide topic. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and so they hear someone playing a lot of notes, and that's what they think jazz is. That's the, the non-educated person's exposure to jazz is, yeah, they played a bunch of notes, and I thought it was really boring. If it was boring, it wasn't jazz. Because jazz should be the most engaging, emotional, heart-wrenching music you can hear if it's done properly. We were doing a lot of work with the workshop on, on Friday with the kids at, at the school, weren't we, with, with breaking those solos down, specifically for the younger kids starting out. And... Um, you were giving quite a lot of good advice, again, following on with what we've been saying of when to play, when not to play as well. Just in terms of techniques people could maybe do at home, what sort of thing would you advise when you approach a new tune or a blues and you're starting to improvise? What, what would be the best process to follow in terms of listening, playing along, etc.? Well, it, if, if you're listening to a standard, something that's been recorded before, then you should always find other recorded versions of that song. You know, here's Herbie Hancock's recorded version. Here's Charlie Parker. Here's David Sanborn's recorded version. Whoever has already done that song. So you can hear what's possible with the song. A lot of times, 
we don't play things because we haven't even realized the possibilities for what can happen. So part of it's just listening and going, oh man, I didn't, didn't even think of doing that or didn't even think of playing it that way. So my standard concept is if I'm working on a song, I find the pre-recorded versions first and I live with those versions for a while and soak up what those players have brought to the song. Now, then I'll try and kind of pick and choose, well, I really like that phrase or that lick that this guy played. And so I'll learn that phrase, note for note, and transpose it through different keys. And ideally, you should take it through all 12 keys, that specific lick. Then I sit down and I try, and there are a lot of, there's so many books of transcriptions out there you can find now where they have the solos transcribed of that performance. So I'll get my transcription. So now I have my pre-recorded version, my transcription, and I'll pr practice the transcription along with that soloist. And I'll try to emulate their phrasing and the way they played it and, and the inflections they put on the notes and try to get that down. Then I have my play-along track of that song, which is now just rhythm section. So now what I do is I take that transcription again and I try to play it myself separate from that other recorded version. But now... I start to add my inflections. And, well, I like phrasing it this way or phrasing it that way. And then finally, after I've done all this homework on the background of the song, now I just leave all of that behind and I start doing my own experimentation and finding my own things that I want to say in the song and I go from there. And so part of that then is taking the song in as many horrible, awful, bad directions as you can think of doing. Well, I'm going to play it, you know, a half tone off from where it should be. You know, because you find it's through those accents, accidents and through that experimentation that you find some really great places to go with music. And, and that's the other thing that beginning players, they tend to be very conservative <clears throat> in what they'll play on a song and what they'll practice. Well, the whole point of practicing is to see how far you can take it. Push that envelope. If you're just in your room by yourself, that's when you try and take it as far left as you can. Play outside and squeaks and squawks and, and whatever you can think of because then you take that and you distill it down into, well, that works. This works on that song.